Scamming is an industry that's existed for thousands of years. Even back in the 1800s, people like Sir Hemingway III would take out a life insurance policy on their dear old mother they planned on accidentally giving an unfortunate tumble down the stairs. I've fallen and I can't get up! In Roblox, of course. In contemporary times, these schemes occur on the internet, aimed at those with limited knowledge about investing, cryptocurrency, and business. The prevalence of fraud within the crypto industry has contributed significantly to the perception that cryptocurrency is a whole is a scam. Notably, figures like CoffeeZilla have gotten attention in recent years thanks to his relentless efforts in unmasking various cases of deception. I would contend that these people are literally financially murdering people. I mean, literally, it's a yes. fact. People committed suicide because they lost everything. I'm sure FTX as well. FT, of course. You know, the bigger the bigger the scam, there's just statistically, it almost becomes impossible that you don't at least, if not financially, sort of metaphorically murdering a family, you literally kill somebody. His efforts have not only exposed these individuals, but have directly contributed to their arrests. Others have gotten off, like Logan Paul, Rice Gum, Ice Poseidon, and the actual Wolf of Wall Street. While some, like Sam Bankman-Fried, have actually gotten extremely long sentences. In today's video, we'll delve deeper into these cases and determine if they deserve their status as a victim of CoffeeZilla, or rather, a victim of their own greed. One of the first big breaks for CoffeeZilla was Jay Mazzini. Jay gained considerable traction on Instagram around 2019, strategically curating a persona of generosity. He posted videos in which he handed out large amounts of cash to drive through workers, essentially constructing a narrative of being a good guy who gave away his wealth to the less fortunate. Subsequently, he garnered a following of nearly 1 million people on Instagram, collaborating with personalities like 50 Cent in the creation of his giveaway-themed content. Alongside these endeavors, Mazzini ventured into the fashion industry with Mazzini Italy. Supposedly, the proceeds from this clothing line played a significant role in his giveaways. He then launched Mazzini Academy in July 2019. This paid online program purported to offer guidance and assistance for those eager to learn effective investment strategies. But it wasn't long before dubious practices and suspicious activities began to emerge. Mazzini was promoting cash giveaways through his clothing brand, sometimes as high as $10,000. The catch being that you had to purchase multiple items from Mazzini Italy to enter. See, this is how Jay Mazzini really makes his money. He does giveaways where he will say, for the next X number of orders, I'll be giving you back money. And it's not like an insignificant amount. This is often life-changing amounts of money, but the requirement is you have to buy products from his site, MazziniItaly.com, in order to enter to win. Jay then ventured into a new realm that significantly bolstered his earnings. Bitcoin, specifically utilizing deceptive practices within the crypto sphere. He'd make Twitter posts indicating his interest in purchasing Bitcoin at prices exceeding the prevailing market rates. To amplify the allure of his offer, he claimed to bypass exchanges due to their limitations on the purchase quantities he desired. He urged interested parties to message him on Twitter Employing a deceitful tactic known as an affinity scam, Jay would attempt to establish a sense of camaraderie and trustworthiness with potential victims by attempting to identify with them as a fellow Muslim. This tactic was a way to foster a false sense of familiarity among his targets. Victims would initiate a conversation with Jay and eventually send him money in anticipation of the promised transaction. It never came. These individuals who had already entrusted him with their funds were left with severe losses, sometimes in the thousands. Meanwhile, those enrolled in Mazzini's investment education program grew increasingly suspicious following an unsettling incident wherein the influencer directed them to collectively invest in a single stock, insisting they hold it until its value soared significantly. He orchestrated a pump and dump strategy which led to financial losses for numerous individuals who had trusted him. Moreover, those who entrusted their investments to Mazzini's halal capital observed no discernible returns, exacerbating their financial woes. These fraudulent activities persisted until CoffeeZilla released a series of videos shedding light on his deceptive practices. Coffee conducted interviews with victims, meticulously outlining their experiences, including instances where Mazzini flaunted cryptocurrency accounts purportedly filled with substantial sums, yet failed to deliver any returns on investments made by his followers. As these videos gained attraction, mounting scrutiny intensified the pressure on Jay Mazzini. Under this weight, it looked like Jay knew the gig was up when he deleted almost every one of his accounts. But this is where things get weird. Kidnapping and arrests. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it got crazy. The backdrop of this unexpected arrest stemmed from a 
heated dispute between Jay and another Instagram account holder named Amjad Mashal. Mashal had asserted on Instagram that Jay was a scammer and he was clearly not happy about it. This led to a bit of a feud, but it looks like negotiations were going to finally take place in person to calm it all down and explain Jay's side. On March 15th, 2021, it was reported that Mazzini arranged a meeting with Mashal under the pretext of discussing the contentious scam Instagram account. But instead of engaging in a civil conversation, Mazzini and several accomplices reportedly abducted Mashal during the meeting. They subjected him to physical assault, coercing him to confess to operating his Instagram page. Court documents detailed how Mazzini explicitly instructed Mashal to delete any posts that labeled him as a scammer. Threats of violence were made by Mazzini and his associates if Amjad dared to involve the police, further intensifying the distressing situation. Following this ordeal, Mashal was abandoned on a street in Passaic, New Jersey, requiring a visit to the hospital due to the injury sustained during the abduction and assault. Law enforcement arrested Jay two days later in connection with the kidnapping, and this is when the walls really started to crumble. Jay Mazzini just got an arrest warrant issued by the FBI. He's been detained by the FBI, and we got new charges related to the Bitcoin scam we covered a long time ago. We've been going after Jay Mazzini for three months, guys. Over three months. And boys, he's done. The goose is cooked, he's finished. The incident of kidnapping triggered a series of substantial legal repercussions for Jay. His arrest on kidnapping charges prompted the FBI to intensify their scrutiny, leading them to delve deeply into his finances. Authorities unearthed that Jay had amassed millions of dollars through fraudulent means, implicating him in various illicit activities such as wire fraud. Subsequent to Jay's incarceration, a surprising development transpired. One of his associates attempted to approach the individual that Jay had kidnapped. This associate offered a significant bribe of $100,000 to persuade the victim to alter his testimony in favor of a friend within Jay's inner circle. Astonishingly, the victim, Amjad Mashal, succumbed to this bribe and provided false testimony, manipulated under the deceitful circumstances. However, Mashal himself then faced legal consequences much later for his acceptance of that bribe. After an extensive legal process spanning two years, Jay eventually entered a guilty plea encompassing charges of kidnapping, wire fraud, wire fraud conspiracy, and money laundering, amounting to a staggering sum of at least $8 million. On the kidnapping charge, Jay secured a plea deal that would result in a five-year prison sentence. However, the charges of wire fraud, wire fraud conspiracy, and money laundering carried the weight of potential repercussions of up to 20 years in prison. This marked a monumental triumph for Coffeezilla, who played a pivotal role in the real-time apprehension of a scammer, resulting in substantial prison time. Moreover, this high-profile case would receive additional attention as it became a part of a new Hulu show titled Age of Influence, where Coffeezilla participated in an in-depth interview, further shedding light on the intricate details and implications of this case. His 11-part video series on YouTube had brought the story to the public, from the $100 million scam he uncovered at the onset to Jay going to jail, something Coffee gladly took credit for. Jay had operated for years despite the attention from Coffee's channel. He thought he would get away with it forever, which is probably why, after years of not being caught, he was so confident he wouldn't be caught for kidnapping someone. As I said, the recommended sentence is eight to 10 years, which is just insane. Uh, and I think just sets such a good precedence for people who think they can scam online and get away with it. They think that just because you're an influencer, the rules don't apply to you. And clearly that's not true. I think the moral of the story is probably don't commit wire fraud and don't kidnap people. They seem like pretty good lessons to learn here. The Save the Kids token emerged as a cryptocurrency created for charity, purported to allocate a portion of its transaction fees toward a charity operated by Binance. Prominent celebrities like Ricegum, Joel Morris of X Academy, and Summer Rae, along with several members from the FaZe Clan, including K, Jarvis, Nikan, and Tico, extensively promoted the Save the Kids token. Their involvement ranged from appearing in promotional videos to posting incessant tweets actively encouraging their fan bases to invest in this cryptocurrency. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, a bit. Ep20 token redistributing wealth to both holders and charities. Actually, it turns out to have just redistributed wealth to the people who got in on the ground floor, aka these guys. 
The Save the Kids token made its debut on June 5th, 2021, entering the trading arena via the Pancake Swap Exchange, identified by the symbol KIDS, with an initial trading value hovering at approximately 2 cents USD per token. However, the token's value swiftly plummeted immediately after launch, experiencing a drastic nosedive, dwindling to less than half a cent. This downward trend continued, with the token's price dwindling even further, eventually reaching a dismal valuation of around 0.00138 USD dollars by the onset of July 2021. Several members of FaZe embroiled in the Save the Kids debacle hastily initiated damage control measures. FaZe K, in particular, attempted to mitigate the fallout by asserting his naivete regarding the endorsement of what he deemed as an exceptional investment opportunity to his devoted fan base. He offered profuse apologies, acknowledging his own foolishness and the betrayal of his fans' trust. But amid his attempts to elicit sympathy and understanding, many saw through what they perceived as insincere excuses and attempts to pass off responsibility. While a segment of the audience seemed inclined to accept his explanations without question, the majority were not swayed. It's important to highlight that the actual masterminds behind this enterprise weren't widely recognized figures. According to CoffeeZilla's investigation, the project was started by Lucas, who then in turn revealed that the initiative was initially conceived by two individuals known by the pseudonyms Manny and H. Just the, just the letter H. Yeah. My theory, a group of large money names are going around finding dev teams, finding promoters, and setting up a large hyped launch, then dipping initially. He also told me the only real contact he had was to a guy named Manny and H. I asked for their contact information. He said, no clue. Blocked. I got blocked by all of the team, basically. CoffeeZilla then shed light on the significant crash experienced by Save the Kids. He highlighted the specific actions of key influencers involved in the project, attributing the token's downfall to specific sell-offs by influential figures that backed the project to begin with. According to Coffee, Jarvis offloaded approximately two-thirds of his token holdings, while Nikan sold off around one-third of his stash. Phase K purportedly sold nearly his entire collection of tokens, an action projected by CoffeeZilla to be valued at approximately eight $80,000. Their actions triggered a domino effect, causing panic selling and a significant devaluation of the token. This is FaZe Jarvis's wallet. He got in the pre-sale and quickly sold out two-thirds of his total holdings within days of the launch. This is FaZe Nikan. He immediately sold about a third of his total holdings and then seems to have held on to the rest. But by far, the really bad one was FaZe K's wallet. He dumped all of his kids tokens immediately. Within 24 hours, he went from 6.2 billion tokens to four tokens now. That's right. He sold all but four tokens. The occurrence of this pump and dump stemmed from its anti-whaling mechanism, a feature implemented to deter major stakeholders from offloading a significant portion of their holdings in a short time period. Initially, the platform outlined a mechanism, which designated that any individual possessing over 0.5% of the entire token supply as a whale. These whales were subject to stringent limitations, restricted to only selling 20% of their total holdings every 24 hours. This constraint would persist until their ownership stake fell below the designated 0.5% threshold. However, upon further scrutiny, it came to light that there had been a last-minute alteration to the coding of the mechanism. This unanticipated modification allowed these designated whales to bypass the initial constraints entirely. This granted them the ability to liquidate their entire holdings within one minute. Following Coffee's investigation, FaZe Clan swiftly released a public statement on July 1st in response to the scandal. Instead of providing support, the company chose to take action by suspending three individuals associated with the controversy. Phase K, however, faced more severe repercussions as he was completely ousted from the organization. Phase Clan maintained a stance of detachment, asserting that they had no direct involvement or even a comprehensive awareness of their members' involvement in promoting this questionable token. The company positioned these activities as independent endeavors pursued by individual members outside the scope of their affiliation with the Phase Clan. Approximately a week later, K attempted to address it with a two-minute-long apology video. Contrary to offering a sincere acknowledgement of his errors or extending genuine remorse, Kay's approach veered in a different direction. He opted to portray himself as both the aggrieved victim and a valiant hero, poised to unveil the actual mastermind orchestrating this deceptive scheme, Sam Pepper. This maneuvering paints Sam Pepper as the primary culprit, deflecting accountability from other implicated parties. So we've uncovered significant evidence which confirms that a dishonest person abused his trust with me to scam everybody. 
This person gained my trust and the trust of my friends while still encouraging us to be the public faces of his scheme. He then abused that trust to go and alter the code right before launch, resulting in six figure profits for him and then leaving the rest of us to be blamed. Yet, the details seem to contradict this narrative. CoffeeZilla swiftly responded to Phase K's attempts to issue a cease and desist notice, unraveling the deception woven in an effort to shield himself from the looming backlash. In Phase K's version of events, Sam Pepper was portrayed as the single instigator behind the notorious Save the Kids crypto scam, allegedly manipulating investors and capitalizing on the peak by selling his tokens for personal gain. But the timeline of sales contradicted this, with with compelling evidence that Kay had initiated his own dump 30 minutes before Sam Pepper. Moreover, the accounts and wallets supposedly uncovered by Kay, flaunted as incriminating evidence, crumbled under scrutiny. Rather than belonging to Sam Pepper, these accounts were linked to fellow investors who bore the brunt of losses, while the wallet in question was attributed to a user known as Boink underscore Boink. While Sam Pepper did indeed have a role in the debacle, this hard evidence presented by CoffeeZilla painted a more intricate picture, implicating Phase K as an equal participant in steering the calamitous trajectory of events. Both individuals seemed entrenched in a frenzied effort to cast blame, each endeavoring to absolve themselves of accountability. Reports even surfaced alleging Sam's departure from the country, purportedly fleeing back to the UK in an attempt to evade the mounting repercussions. The Save the Kids debacle stands out as one of the most egregious influencer scams to date. And even more shocking is that it was all done under the guise of charity. These guys used saving kids as a way to get rich quick. And I don't even think they saved any kids. Despite the magnitude of this scandal, no one ended up facing actual legal repercussions. The only thing that was actually hurt was the reputations of all of the creators involved, especially Kay. TechLead is someone that CoffeeZilla has had an extended relationship with in the past. TechLead himself, known for his satirical take on tech content, has seemingly been on a downward spiral since 2020, encountering a series of personal and professional setbacks, notably including the loss of his wife, child, and his job at Facebook. Recent controversies starting in 2020 have also embroiled TechLead in drama, with a fallout with another tech YouTuber named Joma, alongside a third partner, Clement, over an issue relating to advertising his interview prep business. A few days ago, one of them released his full name name on a web page that was designed to try to make sure that he never got a job. That was preceded by several days, even months of threats. I was part of some of those exchanges as an intermediary and I tried to prevent this dox from happening and tried to explain that this is not the action that should be taken. But it goes far deeper. Allegations surfaced regarding questionable tactics by tech lead and Matt Tran, such as utilizing a fake site resembling Clements to redirect users to his page. This YouTuber's approach has long been steeped in a satirical style that occasionally crosses the line of controversy, combining a facetious demeanor with elements of self-promotion. Despite his controversial persona, tech Lead's content remains popular, particularly among tech enthusiasts eager to glean insights from an ex-Googler and ex-Facebook employee. Trend Black, another burgeoning tech and comedy YouTuber, took a comedic stance, producing videos that humorously mocked Tech Lead. These videos seemed well-deserved and maintained a respectful tone. However, the situation took a disturbing turn when Trend became the target of a damaging SEO campaign against his name. CoffeeZilla would cover this controversy around 2020 and call out Tech Lead for his unfair use of the copyright system. But that's not where their shared history ends. Tech Lead had found himself entangled in legal issues due to redirecting web traffic unethically from his competitor's site, AlgoExpert.io, to his own site. This led to a subsequent apology and issuance of an apology letter addressed to AlgoExpert in May of 2021. Moreover, he also made a significant shift in his stance on cryptocurrencies. Tech Lead, real name Patrick Xu, initially voiced skepticism and concern about the crypto market, cautioning investors and revealing his decision to sell off all of his Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano holdings. In a YouTube video from May May 19th, he alerted his viewers to emerging information that made him cast doubt on the legitimacy of the entire crypto market, hinting at the possibility of a Ponzi scheme inflating it. This startled many of his followers, who trusted his insights. Recently, some information has come to light that has made me skeptical about this whole cryptocurrency market, thinking that the whole thing could be being pumped up by a Ponzi scheme. And I wanted to make this video quickly to warn any of you out there as well who may have substantial life savings of your own also in cryptocurrencies. But on the 1st of 
July 2021, Xiu blindsided his audience by unveiling the launch of a new digital currency dubbed Million Token. This revelation obviously starkly contrasted his previous warnings against crypto investments. The announcement touted Million Token is a decentralized digital currency tailored for millionaires, pegged to a minimum value of $1 USDC. With a total supply of 1 million tokens and a market cap exceeding $1 million USDC. In a bid to lend credibility to Million Token, Xiu declared in a YouTube video that he had invested a staggering $1 million of his personal funds into the venture, positioning himself as having a substantial stake in his success. If he did it, why wouldn't you? This declaration captured the interest of his subscriber base, fostering the belief that Xiu had significant skin in the game, potentially giving him a lot to lose if the venture failed. He was building trust. However, as the truth unraveled, it became evident that Patrick Xiu's claims were unsubstantiated and misleading. Contrary to his assertions, investigations into his own wallet address by CoffeeZilla revealed that the entirety of the funds used to kickstart Million Token came directly from the project's investors. Xiu had misled his subscribers by falsely claiming to have invested one million of his own money at the onset of the Million Token initiative. As he sold off the tokens, he used the money amassed from the investors' contributions to back Million Token, creating a facade of personal investment when in reality, he didn't have much. He never discloses in the video that he created the coin. Instead, he pitches it as if he just found it randomly. In fact, what's really been taking all of my attention lately has been the new Million cryptocurrency. In the charts, Million has continued to dominate up 60% over 24 hours with heavy volume, $15 million of trading volume. Guys, I sat through this whole video. The whole time he makes it sound like, hey guys, I found this coin. I found this cool coin. <laughs> and not only does he obscure his involvement in an ad about his token, he then lies about it by saying there are no whales. I mean, in the Million Project, we don't even have whales anymore. It's just distributed amongst everybody. The largest whale maybe owns 3% or so. 3%. The largest whale owns 3%, says the guy who right now still owns over 14% of the coin. Upon conducting an in-depth analysis of TechLead's blockchain wallet address, Coffee revealed that while TechLead did indeed purchase $50,000 worth of USDC from Coinbase, the funds utilized in his transactions via Uniswap were exclusively sourced from the contributions of million token investors. In essence, TechLead didn't assume any real financial risk of his own, but instead employed the money from other individuals to finance the entire of the Million Token Initiative. Moreover, TechLead's own admission in an August 8th YouTube video corroborated this, where he openly confessed in his personal investment in the Million Token amounted to only 50 grand. His statements can be heard in the video posted on August 8th, underscoring the negligible extent of his actual financial commitment to the project. But it doesn't end there. TechLead, perhaps anticipating potential regulatory entanglements with the SEC, took a strategic approach to cover his tracks and mitigate legal risks. He explicitly cautioned both his subscribers and prospective Million Token investors, stating, this token is too risky for investment, so Million Token should not be considered an investment by any means. This is a social experiment and really pure speculation. It's kind of a game to see what happens to us with this. In essence, he tried to reframe Million Token as a mere speculative venture rather than an investment opportunity, possibly to skirt any legal repercussions associated with investment claims. In the end, TechLead would make $3.3 million, but still receive an insane amount of backlash for essentially scamming his entire fan base. Tech Lead would then actually respond with a video. He titled it, I'm so sorry, I'm going to jail as a millionaire. In his video, Tech Lead challenged CoffeeZilla's perspective, accusing him of embracing a victim mentality and discrediting his accusations. Curiously, Tech Lead attempted to portray his own cryptocurrency as successful and widely trending across crypto charts, a claim that contradicted the actual performance of his coin, which wasn't faring as well as he said. Adding to the mix, Tech Lead didn't stop there. He took to Twitter and hurled accusations of racism at CoffeeZilla, an accusation that was seemingly unfounded and was puzzling to many. In an almost paradoxical twist, Tech Lead, while attempting to refute the allegations, inadvertently ended up confirming their validity through his own words and actions. Moreover, Tech Lead's attempt to deflect blame and shift focus away from the core issues at hand became evident when, despite his earlier admissions of deceit caught on camera, he now sought to downplay or dismiss these confessions, creating an aura of inconsistency and confusion around the entire thing. There is one point Tech Lead did address of mine, and this was the part where I said he lied about saying that he put a million dollars of his own money into million token and guess what he admits i'm right and you know to clarify okay when i started the project i bootstrapped with 50,000 usd coins paired to 50,000 million tokens that's exactly what i said 
So he's admitting it. He did not put in a million dollars of his own money. He used your money. Ultimately, Tech Lee's response seemed to be a convoluted mix of self-defense, deflection, and baseless accusations towards Coffee, which further muddled the already murky water surrounding his involvement in the cryptocurrency scandal. The attempt to discredit Coffeezilla and divert attention from the crux of the matter only served to create more skepticism and reinforce the validity of the accusations brought against him. All in all, I feel nothing but sympathy for the people who will end up losing money on this project. You thought your money was going to the moon, and instead, it went to this guy who can't stop bragging about how rich he is. But to this day, Tech Lead is a pretty successful channel. His views have dipped, but they're still there. He's getting more than 100,000 views per video. That being said, his credibility around investments is largely gone, thanks to CoffeeZilla's reporting on his strange tactics. Ice Poseidon's journey in the realm of online streaming began with a bang, gaining prominence in the mid-2010s, notably around 2014 and 15 through RuneScape. However, his tenure on the Twitch platform was nothing short of tumultuous. The saga of suspensions and infractions followed Ice Poseidon like a shadow, culminating in a permanent ban from Twitch in April 2017. The final straw that led to his banishment from the platform was an alarming incident of being swatted while on board an American Airlines flight bound for Phoenix. The notorious swatting incident that led to his ousting from Twitch was shrouded in controversy, with claims that it was a staged hoax orchestrated by Ice Poseidon for publicity in tandem with his viewers. I personally don't believe it was orchestrated. I think Ice's audience was just crazy, and as a result, someone decided to swat him. I should also note here that I consider Ice to be an internet legend, and I like a lot of his streams. That being said, not a lot of nice things to say about him today. After a lot of turmoil, Ice Poseidon found a new home on YouTube where he continued streaming and posting videos to his fan base. but apparently the money just wasn't what it once was for him, and he was desperate for a quick buck. Coffee had been investigating Ice for a while, and he would finally reveal what he'd been looking into. In a nutshell, Ice Poseidon managed to deceive his followers into investing in CX Coin, a platform he proudly initiated for content creators to receive cryptocurrency donations. However, he didn't stick around to make it a success story. Instead, he swiftly turned the tables on his faithful supporters. Here's the kicker. He amassed a whopping $500,000 from them, padded his own pockets with $300,000 of that five, and treated himself to a new Tesla. I take back anything nice I said about this guy because not only did he rug his fans, but you bought a Tesla? Literally buy any other car. Anything. Oh, the comments are turned off. I wonder why that is. Once he investigated the situation, Coffee posted a video to his channel going over what Ice had done with the CX coin, and he even managed to get an interview from Ice himself. But rather than apologize or even admit wrongdoing, he seemed to have a much more self-centered perspective, saying he would not be giving the money back because he wanted to keep it. If you want the answer, uh, yeah, I could could give the money back. It is within my power. Um, but I'm going to look out for myself and not do that. I, I, you know, I don't like know what else to say. That's just the most honest answer. He did not display an ounce of guilt. Instead, he blatantly admitted to betraying every single one of his fans who had placed their trust in his questionable project. What's more, it took him merely two weeks to abandon ship. He justified his actions by claiming he was just looking out for himself, shamelessly shifting the blame to his followers, accusing them of getting too emotional about it all. Ice would then make another response on Twitter after the insane amount of backlash he would get after the video was made. The post has a lot of terminology and might be hard to grasp if you are a noob to crypto, but everything is verifiable and I encourage people to go check for themselves. I did not steal or scam anyone, nor did I make money on the expense of others. I don't really expect anyone to side with me because the narrative of me stealing from my fans is much more juicy, but that's not the reality, and I hope some people can see that. His defense rested on the assertion that he promoted the project solely to individuals knowledgeable about cryptocurrency, suggesting that he avoided marketing it to casual fans who might be easily swayed. In his defense, he vehemently denied it was a rug pull or scam, adamantly claiming that while he did pocket a significant 300000 from the venture, it wasn't at the expense of his fans or investors. He delved into some technical details, explaining his actions behind the scenes. He took a dive into the intricacies, mentioning, when I took a portion of the LP, nearly $300,000, there weren't many real holders or substantial investors in the token by that point. The top holder had around 15 BNB worth of tokens, and the 50th holder had a meager 0.6 BNB worth of tokens. Ice Poseidon argued that the staggering 400k in the liquidity pool, with 264k in LP and 156k in buyback function, was excessive and posed a risk of devaluation due to the crypto market fluctuations. He revealed his move to withdraw 250,000 from the LP, placing 80k back in the LP and leaving 100k in the buyback function, ostensibly to salvage the situation. But despite the explanations and attempts to rationalize his actions, Ice Poseidon's CX coin project 
project was a failure, meeting an abrupt end just a few weeks after his launch, contrary to the promises he made to many regarding its long-term viability. CoffeeZilla promptly created a response video, delving into the intricacies of Ice Poseidon's twit longer. Summing up the situation, it was, by far, one of the most brazen and audacious examples of scamming that he had encountered. Ice Poseidon adamantly claimed that what happened wasn't a scam, yet declared he wouldn't refund any of it. You could just replace it with, I'm keeping the money. It just reads so much better that way. Look, the whole thing actually reads better. I'm keeping the money. I'm keeping the money. I'm keeping the money. I'm keeping the money. See, it doesn't the idea get gets across so much better. Now, another amazing part about this too is the idea that he says right there, which is that he has to take out the money because the crypto markets are dropping. But when I asked Ice Poseidon where he was going to put the money that he took out of the crypto markets, he told me he's going to put it in the crypto markets. Uh, invest into crypto, Ethereum, mainly. See, it's so obvious, guys, if you just have a big brain, it, you have to have a high IQ. Remember, he had to take the money out of the crypto markets because that's a terrible investment. And the real place to put the money is in the crypto markets because that's where the big money's at. The fallout from this particular incident had a profound and enduring impact on ICE. Even today, many individuals continue to regard him unfavorably due to this crypto event. In fact, ICE is kind of fine. ICE never prided himself on being a good person in the first place, openly embracing his persona as a scumbag content machine since his days of IRL streaming on Twitch. Today, he's moved his operation to kick, and while the viewership analytics on that site are questionable, he reportedly is averaging well over 10,000 viewers per stream, and is likely making tens of thousands a month in donations and crypto casino payouts. He also recently wore women's underwear in Thailand and got arrested for it, before being released and leaving the country. Pretty funny, but also, why? <laughs> Speed is one of the biggest and youngest streamers that's blown up over the years. Known for his immense admiration for Cristiano Ronaldo, and being very good at practicing his inside voice. <laughs> Speed's prominence in the realm of influencers makes the subsequent turn of events all the more startling. It was a momentous occasion. Speed announced his eagerly awaited stream where he would meet his idol. This sparked a massive surge in viewership, attracting tens of thousands to tune in. But the twist was unexpected and rather disappointing. The Ronaldo, whom Speed was set to meet, turned out to be a hired actor. Instead of a genuine interaction with his idol, the stream was a paid sponsorship to promote a crypto venture. He appeared on live wearing a shirt blatantly advocating the purchase of Paradox Crypto Coin. Alongside him were a few guests who emphatically declared that this new coin would inevitably become the biggest crypto in the world. They even enticed viewers by promising a PlayStation 5 to those who signed up for the coin. Naturally, this abrupt shift infuriated Speed's entire audience. The chat was quickly inundated with dissent and disapproval from viewers. As Speed began receiving donations and signing consoles, his audience called him out for his apparent promotion of the Paradox coin, which many predicted would be just another coin promoted to get a quick bag. But instead of owning up to the misdirection, Speed took a different approach. Approach. He instructed his moderators to ban anyone expressing criticism about the Paradox coin during the stream. You sold, sold out. out. They're, They're using you speed. This is just, just bad. bad. That is crazy, bro. Like, them comments like that, bro. It's making me like, that's crazy, bro. The fact that I ever made, like, the fact that y'all, like, like, y'all just sticking me like that. It's just crazy. CoffeeZilla delved into this promotion with an intent to uncover the real essence behind the Paradox coin. His exploration led to an unearthing of several facets of the project, exposing seven different elements connected to it. Among these facets was a peculiar discovery. The coin was associated with a video game, but the reality was far from the grandeur suggested by its developers. The game itself appeared antiquated, reminiscent of a dated PlayStation 2 era game, rather than anything resembling a modern, polished creation. They had boldly proclaimed this to be a triple-A project. I mean, I guess you could call it that, if you're lying. Instead of exuding the sophistication and refinement one might associate with a top-tier gaming experience, the game bore more resemblance to a mobile game. And frankly, I have to take serious issue with your claim that this is a triple-A game. Yeah, this looks like a basic game you designed at Unreal Engine. I'm sure you have developers behind it. But you admit, you, you wait, 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 you in your understand. own marketing, Compared you describe yourself, wait a second, okay. you Compared describe yourself as an indie okay. game. You one describe second. yourself as an indie game, and then you have the audacity to come on my stream and call yourself a triple A game when you describe yourself as an indie game.
No, no, I don't want to interrupt you, but just yeah. give me. Let's you are interrupting me. Of course you are. You <laughs> don't call points. yourself an indie game on your YouTube channel and then have the audacity to come on my channel and call yourself AAA. The entire concept behind this venture appeared to be more of a sham than a genuine gaming endeavor. This so called game revolved around the idea of purchasing NFT avatars that allowed players to take part in game, ostensibly earning them paracoins, a currency claimed to hold tangible real life value. As much as $400 per week, according to their claims. Their sales pitch took an even stronger turn when they proposed that users could rent out their avatars, supposedly generating a mysterious form of passive income. Additionally, they introduced a staking feature, wherein users could stake their paracoins to earn more paracoins. The entire setup sounded alarmingly akin to a Ponzi scheme, a realization that CoffeeZilla was quick to point out. The promises of substantial earnings, the intricate system of staking and renting avatars for supposed passive income, and the lofty claims of paracoins having substantial real-world value raised a lot of red flags. The longer you lock up your money, the more you earn in a process they call delay and get paid. Sure, I guess. Now, if you want to understand how this entire staking process works, um, their flowchart will leave you even more confused. Here it is. And instead of explaining it, I'm going to label all of this Ponzi nonsense. This is a pro tip for you guys out there. If you ever see a flow chart that seems almost impossibly complicated, uh, it's Ponzi nonsense. Alongside the main branch of Paradox Coin, there were six other offshoots like Paradeo and Paradox Pad, each claiming to yield an incredible 10 to 100 times return on investment. When the developers were cornered and questioned about the clear get rich quick nature of their scheme, their response was very telling. It's hard for me to be quote, quote, professional when y'all are dodging my questions. If y'all want to answer we my questions- We haven't dodged a single question. Ask us the question. Great. Advertising 10x to 100x, is that a get rich quick scheme? Yes or no? No. no. Why? Because it <laughs> is, because it can happen. Okay. It happens okay. every single day of the week in the crypto space. Please get knowledgeable about what happens in the crypto space. This so much of the crypto space is a scam. Oh, oh now crypto you guys. You can oh. Yeah. We got ya! Got ya! We got you, buddy! That's You're a about. Bitcoin hater! You hate crypto! That's why you don't like us! Speed found himself entangled in a flurry of furious comments within his chat, with him adamantly asserting that what had happened wasn't a scam. However, the situation took a turn for worse as their viewers expressed anger, feeling deceived into watching something they hadn't signed up for, and then being bitch slapped with a crypto promotion. This led Speed to issue an apology shortly thereafter. I'm not a scammer, bro! Why do they keep spamming? Bro, I'm not a scammer, dog. I made a little mistake, you know, that I wish I never did, but I'm not a scammer, bro. Coffee suggested that Speed's error was somewhat forgivable given his young age of 17. He expressed hope that Speed had learned a valuable lesson, that he didn't need to betray the trust of his audience in pursuit of quick financial gains. After Speed's part in the incident, the narrative around Paradox Coin didn't close just yet. Approximately one week after CoffeeZilla's confrontation with the founders, a founder initiated threats against a small TikTok creator who echoed similar sentiments to CoffeeZilla. Paradox Coin's sketchy premise along with the gangster tough guy act from its promoters were not a good look to say the least. Why would a legitimate crypto investment need its owners to threaten violence against critics? And these threats aimed at the smaller creator were in stark contrast from their previous interaction with CoffeeZilla, where they at least tried to be cordial. Which when I catch you, I'm gonna smash your teeth in. Every single time you look at your face in the mirror, you're gonna see your broke up nose bust up in 20 different places. That's what I'm gonna do, that big f nose of yours. Right? You thought it was funny, innit? You thought it's funny. You just troll man's on the internet. Oh, I'm not an internet guy. I'm gonna put your f name out. I'm gonna put 10 bags down. So anyone that shows me this guy's address, I'll give him 10 bags. And then I'm gonna see what you're gonna say when I come there. But this wasn't the only time this had happened. CoffeeZilla, being the thorough investigator that he is, delved further into the background of the founders to uncover any prior instances akin to this one. And indeed, his efforts yielded results. He stumbled upon a video capturing the individual in question engaging in a heated altercation, issuing threats, and even resorting to physical confrontation with an individual who expressed discontent at being recorded without consent. This discovery underscored a pattern of behavior, shedding light on a recurrent tendency towards confrontational and aggressive actions in comparable circumstances. He's apparently lived a lot of his life being a tough guy and threatening people for seemingly no reason. Like, for example, he got in a fight with this guy at the gym uh, who didn't enjoy being filmed. What the fuck? What are you f***ing swearing? What? What are you f***ing swearing at? taking a picture of me. I'm f***ing taking a selfie of f***ing Don't f swear at me. You f swear at me. You're nobody. What are you 
Moreover, in addition to the previously uncovered incidents, there emerged another troubling aspect. The individual had, on separate occasions, sent numerous messages to their salesperson, explicitly endangering their family members. This behavior marked a distressing trend where one of the founders habitually recorded themselves threatening people. Don't record me, help me. Come help me. Huh? We're just making sure that no one can steal this. So we're just making sure. See if it fits in the booth. It don't. We're gonna put it back. Overall, the founder of this so-called groundbreaking cryptocurrency, Paradox Coin, carries a tainted reputation, embodying the very essence of the shaky and unstable beginnings upon which the currency was established. The foundational principles upon which it was built have been marred and corroded by the questionable deeds and character of its originator, ultimately leading to an inevitable nosedive in its market standing and viability. Today, Paradox Coin is largely forgotten, but that's not to say we'll never hear from its founders ever again. I wouldn't be surprised if they end up starring on Coffee's show sometime soon. Sam Bankman Freed and the scandal around FTX is the highest profile case CoffeeZilla has ever covered, and it involves the most losses at an estimated $8 billion. FTX was one of the largest digital currency exchange platforms for buying and selling crypto. As more people invested in cryptocurrencies, they turned to these platforms because they provided a digital wallet to store crypto directly in a personal account. Customers could also store cryptocurrencies on their own by creating a crypto wallet either using software or hardware, which is not part of the platform. Soon after its inception, FTX quickly rose to dominate its market through high-profile acquisitions of struggling competitors. FTX used aggressive marketing campaigns, such as Super Bowl ads, celebrity endorsements, and naming rights to the Miami Heat's arena. These marketing campaigns promised that people could put their money in these accounts and earn higher yields than the average bank. And the celebrity endorsements here are crazy. Tom Brady, Steph Curry, Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary, they were all paid to endorse the product. Their influence contributed to average people dumping buckets of money into the platform and made those involved millions upon millions. Cryptocurrency began to boom in early 2021, and the price of Bitcoin peaked at $64,000, up from 10 grand. Customers began to take notice and venture capital groups invested nearly 2 billion in FTX. But in late 2021 and early 2022, the price of Bitcoin started to decline drastically from its high, and other cryptocurrencies followed. Many major platforms were shutting down, except for FTX, which continued acquiring competitors. Sam Bakeman freed was confident he could keep steering the ship and instead of preparing to cover losses, he prepared to keep expanding. He was doing interviews saying everything was fine. He had people in the public defending him from the media, saying everything would be okay. But eventually, the lies caught up to him. In November 2022, FTX's collapse lasted 10 days, starting on November 2nd and ending on November 12th. It began with the Coindesk article and the leaked balance sheet. Binance initially announced it would sell all of its FTT tokens because of the mishandled and blurred funds. FTX lost billions of dollars. Sam Bankman freed or ordered Alameda Research to sell assets to cover the needed capital from the withdrawals, and he also looked for financing to cover the gap of about $8 billion between what was owed and what could be paid. Investors were trying to get their money out of the platform, seeing that it was clearly failing, but they couldn't because FTX didn't have the money. On November 8th, FTX blocked customers from taking money out of the platform by removing that option online, which meant hundreds of thousands of customers did not have access to their money. When FTX could not pay the $8 billion gap, the company filed for bankruptcy. FTX crash due to mismanagement of funds, lack of liquidity, and the large volume of withdrawals. Binance announced it would buy FTX to prevent a larger market crash, but quickly bailed out of the deal as more news reports of mishandled customer funds surfaced. Meanwhile, Sam used FTX funds to buy personal luxury items, finance elaborate advertising campaigns, and make political donations. And who was covering the situation from the start? Who was really the first to the story? Coffeezilla, of course. He pointed out that FTX was set to fail from the beginning, and celebrity endorsements were not enough to make sure investor funds were safe. There also remain huge questions like how they could have been out billions of dollars in the first place and how exactly they were safeguarding customer funds if suddenly they find themselves at a multi-billion dollar hole in their balance sheet after people actually look to get their money out. It seems to be yet another lesson that you should not trust these crypto exchanges as far as you can throw them and that no matter what their CEOs say about not having to worry about anything, there could be significant liquidity crisis that they're lying to you about. And through a series of interviews with Sam himself, Coffee managed to poke holes in his story, which is part of why Sam is now in jail. Initially, it's quite astonishing to contemplate that there was a time when Sam Bankman Freed was hailed as a visionary business person, steering the technological landscape towards an extraordinary new trajectory.
trajectory. Such was the narrative surrounding him during the initial months of his rise to fame. Prominent shows like 60 Minutes even stood staunchly in his defense whenever incidents veered off course, while numerous mainstream media outlets extolled Sam as a good-hearted figure merely engaged in geeky pursuits within the realm of cryptocurrency. However, amidst this widespread adulation, Coffeezilla emerged as a discerning voice, refusing to be easily beguiled by the facade of acclaim. In fact, he was among the vanguard of influencers who boldly asserted that Sam was in reality a con man, implicated in the misappropriation of billions and the orchestration of a deceitful scheme that resembled a Ponzi scheme. During the initial interview that Coffeezilla managed to cover, the interviewer probed Bankman Freed's assertion of being unaware that FTX's customer funds had been transferred to Alameda Research, the crypto trading division. Bankman Freed responded, attempting to justify his lack of knowledge by citing a multitude of ongoing responsibilities before promptly exiting the interview. In the subsequent interview, this line of questioning continued, challenging Sam's portrayal as an inept leader at FTX. The interviewer managed to highlight a recurring pattern where Bankman Freed appeared to attribute every critical juncture to mere embarrassingly constructed mistakes. He voiced skepticism, casting doubt on Bankman Freed's narrative, questioning the plausibility of a multitude of such embarrassing mistakes occurring under his leadership. Yeah, I, I have a couple questions. Read the margin accounts. I mean, um, there's sort of all this talk about the terms of service. Did you break terms of service? Did you not? You're basically claiming that there was this separate side of your terms of service, which said that uh, if people had margin accounts, you could use kind of their funds or there was looser language around that. But I talked to somebody from Alameda and asked how big the position of like or how many people had assets in the type of accounts that that terms of service would apply to versus the regular terms of service, which said you couldn't use their money. And they said it was about a billion that was in the margin trading or the, the margin like um, side of things where you could reuse their funds or whatever. And there was the rest of it was not there. So does that mean the rest of the money was stolen? I mean, like, it seems like you're putting all your eggs behind this one excuse about, you know, there was this separate side of the terms of service. How do you address everyone else? So I don't have all the data in front of me. My memory is that it was substantially more than a billion um, in the margin trading program. Um, but I don't have that data in front of me right now, so I can't verify that. Um, as these series of Twitter spaces continued, the third and concluding session emerged as the pivotal and defining moment above them all. Coffeezilla, resolute in his pursuit of uncovering the definitive evidence, persisted in his endeavor to elicit a conclusive admission from Sam. Throughout the preceding interviews, Sam had evaded direct inquiries and adeptly sidestepped any semblance of accountability. Sam's persistent defense against the allegation of being a con man predominantly pivoted on the narrative centered on Alameda research, with him adamantly asserting that his role as CEO shielded him from any knowledge or involvement in potential wrongdoing. Despite the glaring implausibility of this claim, the truth behind it remained elusive for the time, prompting many to redirect their focus to scouring through FTX's terms of service for potential discrepancies or contradictions. Coffeezilla astutely discerned that fixating solely on the TOS served as more of a diversionary tactic, deflecting attention from the crux of the matter. His realization dawned upon the crucial inquiry. Why were customers' funds being lent out? Practice in direct contradiction to FTX's explicitly stated policy, which constituted a clear case of fraud activity. And as I reflected on this, I, I realized all of the talk about margin trading, future trading, wire transfers to Alameda, all, all of it is a smokescreen from the big problem. The big problem is that some percentage of FTX's customer base never sent a wire to Alameda. They never signed up to margin trading. They never did spot margin. All they did was put their assets on the platform and they were told that their assets would not be borrowed. It would not be loaned out. And that money would always be there and it wasn't there. Why wasn't it there? There's no other way to explain that. Finally, during the third interview, Coffeezilla would ask Sam this question, to which he would finally get his smoking gun. If it's true that you didn't invest client assets, not even in treasuries, as you said via a now deleted tweet, yeah. why do those client assets no longer exist? I'm just taking a stab at this because I don't have the data, but my, my best guess is the following is that there were a lot of those assets remaining. We processed something like, you know, five or six billion dollars, I think, of withdrawals over the over the few days prior to, or I guess the few days, you know, during the crash. And there are still a few billion dollars of those remaining, I think, in the estate. And so you put those together, you have many billions of dollars of those assets. But I think, and, and so that's part of the answer is that um, 
there were a large number of actual assets there. During this juncture, Bankman Freed conceded that FTX's handling of customer deposits deviated substantially from what they had stipulated within the TOS. This startling revelation amounted to an outright admission of fraud, as aptly pointed out by Coffey. The aftermath was swift. Merely a week after this pivotal interview, Sam found himself apprehended in the Bahamas, finally facing the consequences of his actions and being subjected to justice. While the direct correlation between this interview and Sam's subsequent arrest is unconfirmed, it definitely played a pivotal role in fortifying the case against him. Whether or not the authorities were privy to this interview, I think they probably were. Coffeezilla's pursuit of the truth and exposure of the core deceit within FTX served as a vital contribution that mainstream outlets couldn't even attempt, and as a result, he was cited in a lot of articles. During his time behind bars, there emerged leaked audio recordings wherein Sam was heard expressing his intense disdain towards Coffeezilla, openly admitting that he hated him. Surprisingly, this revelation further propelled Coffeezilla's already burgeoning fame and reputation. However, the ultimate climax arrived in November 20. 2023. Sam was unequivocally pronounced guilty on multiple charges, including fraud, money laundering, and conspiracy, all stemming from the catastrophic collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX and the associated trading entity Alameda Research. This verdict came with a confirmation of guilt across all seven counts, including the serious charge of wire fraud. This all added up to a sentence of 115 years. Reflecting on the entire sequence of events, it's pretty astounding to contemplate Coffeezilla's significant contribution towards the prosecution of this individual. The fact that a YouTuber was able to wield such influence and contribute substantially to the legal resolution of such a high-profile case is very remarkable, and it shows that Coffee stands above the average YouTuber. If anything, he's an investigative journalist. But it's not over. Now, it seems those who promoted FTX in the first place might be in major trouble. FTX investors filed a class-action lawsuit against FTX and its celebrity endorsers on November 15th, 2022. The civil suit claimed FTX used false representation and deceptive conduct. The lawsuit also accused FTX of using a Ponzi scheme to misuse funds and move customer money between entities. This class action lawsuit is still ongoing, and you can actually file as a claimant in this case if your funds were mishandled. Meanwhile, Sam will never work in the crypto space again, and given his lengthy sentence, he'll probably never work at all. Coffee's reporting was instrumental in informing investors and journalists of what was going on with FTX's money. But unfortunately, by the time he got there, it was far too late, and Sam was far too deep with his lies to save almost anyone. Logan Paul, while extremely successful, has been entangled in a web of controversies throughout his career. Coffeezilla encountered one of his most substantial and widely viewed investigations when he scrutinized Logan Paul's Crypto Zoo NFT project, garnering an astounding 10 million views across each of his videos addressing this matter. On the Crypto Zoo website, before subsequent alterations were made in response to the allegations, a descriptor claimed that it was an autonomous ecosystem that enabled zookeepers to engage in buying, selling, and trading of exotic animals and hybrids. Crypto Zoo integrates cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens into an accessible and enjoyable gaming experience with familiar mechanics. Logan initially promoted this game in August of 2021, unveiling it during an episode of Impulsive. He asserted his role as a founder behind the project and boasted about injecting a $1 million investment into it to catalyze its growth. September 1st, CryptoZoo.co. I'm going to tease it. That's all I'm going to say about it now because we're finishing up the development, but I am so excited about this project. It's 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 so fun. It provides a yield with a token, can earn you money. And uh, as a person who understands, I think the NFT space enough to know what works, what people want and what they're looking for, I think my game is gonna make, uh, make some waves. The core concept underpinning the game revolves around CryptoZoo players acquiring an NFT in the form of an egg, which would subsequently hatch into a virtual animal within the game's universe. Players are then able to engage in crossbreeding their animals with other others in the game, aiming to generate rare and unique breeds. The allure lies in the rarity of these animals, as the more exceptional the breed, the greater the potential in-game cryptocurrency earnings through the game's native token, known as Zoo Tokens. Players are required to acquire these Zoo Tokens within the game, even before contemplating the purchase of an NFT egg, thereby anchoring the entire thing to this currency. The initial iteration of Crypto Zoo saw its debut in late 2021, and as per the game's outline development roadmap, subsequent game versions were scheduled for next year. However, However, the trajectory of CryptoZoo's development appeared to have dramatically deviated from its intended course. Despite the initial launch of version 1, none of the milestones on the roadmap had materialized, most notably the critical feature of animal breeding, which constituted a pivotal aspect of CryptoZoo's promotional strategy. The delay or absence of this crucial feature had left many players feeling disenchanted, and in some cases, scammed. Numerous players invested substantial amounts, often thousands of dollars, into zoo tokens and eggs with the anticipation of imminent breeding 
competing functionalities. To make things even worse, CryptoZoo abruptly ceased its social media, ceasing all activity on platforms like Twitter since May of 2022. Fast forward to CoffeeZilla being tipped off and deciding to make a video. This commenced with Logan's assertions regarding the profitability of the game, only to swiftly transition into a montage revealing the testimonies of numerous investors involved. These individuals unequivocally stated that the game failed to function, resulting in substantial losses ranging from thousands to even hundreds of thousands of dollars in real-world currency per investor. The stark contrast between Logan's optimistic claims about the game's profitability and the first-hand accounts of disillusioned investors who suffered considerable financial setbacks laid bare the stark reality behind the enticing promises of CryptoZoo. It's a really fun game that makes you money. A fun game that earns you money? How much did you guys make from CryptoZoo? I lost around $50,000 in CryptoZoo. I lost $40,000. I lost around 15,000 US dollars. I lost $25,000. $120,000. $500,000 Australian, which is half a million in CryptoZoo. Shut up! No, you haven't! Yeah, 500k. Oh, no. During the investigation, CoffeeZilla confronted the primary challenge of figuring out who was accountable for the substantial financial loss incurred. While it might seem easy to point fingers solely at Logan Paul, the actual truth behind the incident appears to have been significantly more intricate and convoluted. Without delving into the intricate details of each person's background, it's worth highlighting Eddie Ibanez's tenure as the team's lead developer for a significant period of time. As per CoffeeZilla's findings, Eddie emerged as an individual with a history of fraudulent conduct, including falsifying his past to secure high-ranking positions within various organizations. Eddie's failure, or perhaps unwillingness, to ensure timely compensation for developers under his purview caused substantial disruption during the developmental phase of CryptoZoo. Nevertheless, it's crucial to note that even after Eddie's dismissal by Jeff Levin, the new developers recruited for the project continued to face similar issues with delayed payments, perpetuating the turmoil within the project's development. Levin, identified as Logan Paul's manager, emerges as another key figure under scrutiny in Kavi's investigation seemingly turning a blind eye to warning signs while overseeing the hiring of Ibanez. His failure to maintain the development team effectively places the blame on his shoulders for a large part of CryptoZoo's failure. Prior to delving into Logan Paul's involvement, it's imperative to examine the role of Crypto King, as highlighted by CoffeeZilla's findings. Allegedly, Crypto King stands accused of being the individual responsible for selling a significant portion of the tokens, reaping substantial profits from these transactions. Screenshots obtained by CoffeeZilla further reveal Crypto King's accusations against Logan Paul, claiming that Paul withheld his own tokens, alleging a staggering sum of $40 million in misappropriation. Crypto King deflects the question by saying, my buyer pushed it back up to $40 million. And Logan says, no, bro, F your buyer. Explain to me what just happened and how there were 30 token holders. And Jake tries to explain that this was just traders and bots happening to find the token. But Logan says, only five of us knew about it. Jake says, well, many people chase volume and new tokens. And to some extent, he's kind of right. But Logan replies, cap. He doesn't believe it. Quote, I can't be the only one who thinks that's too incredibly convenient like someone was tipped off. Logan Paul's pivotal involvement served as the linchpin for lending substantial credibility to the game. He leveraged his status as a famous person, using his podcast to unveil and endorse it, effectively assuming responsibility for marketing it as a pay-to-earn gaming experience. However, the biggest missteps attributable to Logan, as highlighted by investors in the videos, portrayed a disconcerting narrative. It appears that he chose to disengage from discussions around the project as indications of the game's inevitable failure surfaced. This withdrawal from discourse misled devoted fans, inadvertently encouraging continued investment of their time and resources into a project that was a literal abyss of financial loss and shattered promises. Logan Paul didn't sell. Jeff, Logan's manager, didn't sell. But does that make them innocent? Well, I don't think so, because they never built a game they promised people. Logan Paul specifically got millions of dollars spent on this game on the promise of the technology that he never built, that his team never built. And he never addressed the failure except to blame his developers who weren't paid. And you could say he promised to work backwards to fix it, but then never did. But at the same time, it's clearly not just Logan's fault either because there are major team issues, right? You've got Eddie selling millions of dollars of Zoo and then allegedly not paying developers. You've got Jeff who was warned about Eddie, who kept him on the team anyways. And then after they fired Eddie, seems to also have failed to pay developers on time. And then you've got Crypto King himself, who sold the most, but claims he was the guy who was scammed. Logan initially responded to CoffeeZilla with threats to sue, along with a myriad of other lovely things like this. CoffeeZilla, your slime is 
He is a lopsided journalist with an agenda, more like an internet criminal. Oops, wrong video. That was the first response. He actually apologized in another response. But after realizing there's no way he could win because CoffeeZilla was right, Logan Paul would finally come out and apologize, as well as promise to refund investors up to $1.2 million. The unexpected move by Logan Paul to address the situation came as a pleasant surprise, and CoffeeZilla acknowledged his attempt to step forward and assume responsibility. However, while Coffee acknowledged this effort, he also raised issues concerning that apology, aiming to analyze and highlight his nuances. One of his key concerns centered on the lack of genuine remorse conveyed by Logan, suggesting that the apology appeared more as a strategic move for positive public relations rather than a heartfelt expression of regret and empathy towards those who fell victim. Moreover, Coffee pointed out the discrepancies in Logan's proposed refund plan. Notably, the value of Ethereum at the time of Logan's pledge to issue refunds had significantly decreased compared to his previous valuation. While technically the refund in terms of ETH remained unchanged, the actual monetary value had diminished, resulting in, you know, still financial loss for those Involved. Another notable aspect flagged by Coffee was the limited scope of the refund, which solely extended to current holders of CryptoZoo. This approach meant that individuals who had previously invested, even if they sold their tokens at a huge loss, were not included in the refund. Nevertheless, amidst the criticisms, there remained a glimmer of hope as a segment of affected individuals would potentially receive some form of compensation. But one month passed, and then two months passed, and then three months passed, and then six months passed, and expectations turned to disappointment as Logan Paul failed to fulfill his commitment to repay. According to Coffeezilla, there was a glaring absence of any concrete strategy or intent on Paul's part to rectify the situation. In a follow-up aptly titled, Logan Paul's Scam Isn't Over, Coffee took the initiative to shed light on the ongoing predicament. He presented a series of messages sent to Logan Paul in an effort to follow up on the initial assurance to reimburse CryptoZoo token holders. Despite these attempts at communication, the disheartening truth of reality unfolded without any response at all from Logan. Finally, after his fourth attempt, Coffee would get a response, but not from Logan, instead from his defense attorney. So I opened up the letter and it read, we represent Logan Paul. Mr. Paul has informed us of your outreach about the status of the CryptoZoo buybacks. Mr. Paul remains committed to this process. We are working with Mr. Paul to evaluate the best way to achieve this goal. In the meantime, please direct to our attention any further inquiries to Mr. Paul. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Now, that might seem like a good step in the right direction to you. At least we got a response on behalf of Logal. But when I read their response carefully, I realized things were actually worse than I thought because two things are absent from this statement. One, a timeline for refunds and two, a plan for refunds. I mean, you have this abominable statement which says we are working with Mr. Paul to evaluate the best way to achieve this goal. Uh, so you're still at the whiteboard then. Throughout all of 2023, it seemed Logan had no plans to repay investors or even offer further explanation for what went wrong with CryptoZoo. However, in January of 2024, he offered to buy back $2.3 million of what investors lost on the project. He also pledged to take those who he feels truly failed the game to court. But most of you will remember that this is a far cry from the true amount lost. His justification is very interesting. He claims that it's a way for him to make whole those who intended to play CryptoZoo. But apparently the buyback is not intended to compensate say those who, in his words, gambled on the crypto market and lost. This very snide comment at the expense of his investors, who trusted him to deliver a successful project, felt like another backstab to his fans. A sentiment CoffeeZilla echoed in his follow-up video. Will he try to dodge responsibility, cheap out, rip his fans off, and avoid accountability? I think it's the latter. While investors lost millions because of their trust in Paul, ultimately this whole ordeal seems to be a thorn in his side that he wants to get past with as little involvement as possible. The Wolf of Wall Street is a great movie. Following the real life story of Jordan Belfort, a white collar criminal who defrauded his investors of millions of dollars in the late 1980s, landing him in jail. As a result, he currently does speaking tours about his life and has made a pretty good penny off of just being the guy from one of Martin Scorsese's best works. Following the attention garnered by the CryptoZoo scandal, CoffeeZilla redirected his focus towards more intricate fraud operations, specifically targeting Trader's Domain, something that he posited was a much more far reaching 
far-reaching scam. In January, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or CFTC, instigated legal action against Trader's Domain, leveling accusations that the platform served as a facade concealing a scheme that allegedly defrauded a staggering sum of $144 million from over 900 unsuspecting investors. The lawsuit was extensive, asserting that the individuals orchestrating the platform were entangled in three schemes. These schemes enticed investors to funnel their investments into a purported Forex trading firm, a firm that, according to the lawsuit, did not actually exist. Instead, the funds were diverted for personal use, while customers were shown fictitious account statements. Subsequently, the legal action initiated by the CFTC culminated in the immediate shutdown of the trader's domain website. However, delving deeper into his investigation in the collapsed Forex brokerage, Coffee shed light on how big this thing was, claiming that the CFTC's presented figure of $144 million barely scratched the surface. According to CoffeeZilla, the regulator appeared to overlook a staggering amount of $500 million that the firm laundered through cryptocurrency channels. CoffeeZilla suggested that the firm ingeniously orchestrated its operations involving lifestyle and business influencers to solicit investments on behalf of Trader's Domain. I wanted to have a lifestyle change. I wanted to get into something different to give myself a better opportunity in life. And literally, I went through social media. I found Nino on Instagram. I sort of laughed actually because I saw him with his Lambo and all his fun stuff. And me being as old as I am now, maybe, you know, 37 years old, 36 years old, I couldn't really fathom how somebody was doing what they were doing at such a young age. Wow. The answer, of course, to Ted's question is that Nino was scamming people with get rich quick courses. And Ted soon figured this out. He started his own grift called the Forex Family Course, which eventually led to the launch of his very own Forex brokerage called Traders Domain. These influencers portrayed Traders Domain as a lucrative, high-yield firm, supposedly managed by an experienced trader or a sophisticated trading bot. Once individuals wanted to invest, they were provided with access to a website, showcasing their account's performance. Coffee unearthed a detail. The platform's infrastructure was licensed from a third party, allowing manipulations to alter trade records, thereby casting doubt on the legitimacy of the reported performance. Moreover, CoffeeZilla contended that Traders Domain utilized its pool's funds to make payments to investors who chose to withdraw their investments. The founder believed that, quote, the trader's domain is clearly a Ponzi scheme. They have moved over $50 million in cryptocurrency and US currency directly to the trader's domain systems. Not only that, a different payment processor also had their transaction data with trader's domain leaked to us. With the help of a blockchain intelligence company called Crystal Blockchain, we traced even more money that had come in. According to them, Roughly 450 million went into Trader's Domain. And that combined with the 50 million from that other crypto payment processor is where we arrived to our $500 million estimate. Now, bear in mind, this is just crypto. This is not talking about fiat here. And this is real money that went in, not fake Ponzi games. Several people were paid large sums to promote this scheme, one of them being Jordan Belfort or the real Wolf of Wall Street. Coffee contacted Belfort's team, aiming to get some answers as to how involved Jordan was with Trader's Domain. Specifically, Coffee pointed out that as of September 20th, 2022, Belfort held a significant balance of $325,000 within TD under the umbrella of his company, Future Gen LLC. Additionally, Coffee raised concerns regarding Belfort's association as a paid spokesperson for Omega Pro labeling the project as a Ponzi scheme. Belfort's team promptly responded, vehemently refuting any claim suggesting his involvement as a paid spokesperson for Omega Pro. Instead, Belfort's team clarified that his collaboration with Omega Pro solely comprised of speaking engagements at two of their events. This obviously makes no sense, as that's what a spokesperson does. They then continued and said that these were two of over 150 events that Mr. Belfort spoke at that year, and he's never had any affiliation with the company and only vaguely knows what they do. In fact, during his speech with Omega Mega Pro, he specifically stated that he was not there to speak about their particular business or making investments as he was unfamiliar with what they do. This also obviously makes no sense because why would you hire this person to speak on a stage in front of hundreds of people in Panama if that guy doesn't know what he's talking about? Another issue that Coffee had with Jordan is him pushing what seemed like a pressure tactic, convincing people that get rich quick schemes do actually work, or at least he very much implied it. When Coffeezilla told his team that he would be showing this quote, they responded with, the above quote you provided is mildly misleading as it is 
is only the first half of the quote. The full quote from the transcript is below, and Mr. Belfort stands by it to this day. Well, what is that quote? You gotta get rich quick, okay? And the reason for that is because we live in a world that's far too expensive to get rich slowly. You just can't get rich slowly over time, between inflation and currency devaluations and all the hard work. By the time you get rich, it's too f***ing late. But I'm not talking about a get-rich-quick scheme, that's not what I mean. So I'm not advising you to go out and find some get-rich-quick scheme, which is not a legitimate business. This would have been an okay rebuttal, but it turns out they were just flat out wrong or lying about what Jordan had said. What he had actually said was this. You gotta get rich quick, okay? And the reason for that is because we live in a world that's far too expensive to get rich slowly. You just can't get rich slowly over time between inflation and currency devaluations and all the hard work it does. By the time you get rich, it's too f***ing late. And I will tell you this, this is a fact. I'm not talking about a get rich quick scheme. That's not what I mean. So I'm not advising you to go out and find some get rich quick scheme, which this is not. It's a legitimate business, okay? If you didn't notice, the parts they cut out were when Jordan said that Omega Pro was a legitimate business, instead of saying that get rich quick schemes weren't a legitimate business, which made the situation even sketchier. The deliberate exclusion of that quote was glaringly evident because it presented Jordan as knowledgeable about Omega Pro and its operations. This contradicted their prior assertion that Jordan had scant knowledge about the company. Coffee also expressed concern about Jordan's advice to the audience notably when he encouraged them not to look at the gift horse in the mouth. Essentially, the phrase suggests not to examine or scrutinize something too closely or critically to simply trust the situation at face value. Just look f***ing around you. Who can smell money? Can you smell the money? Yes? Lana, can you smell it? Yes? The last and probably biggest problem CoffeeZilla had was Jordan's team's response to his investment, and it kind of speaks for itself with how ludicrous it is. As for Trader's Domain, Mr. Belfort has no knowledge of Trader's Domain or any link they may have with Omega Pro, other than that a very close friend of his said that he was making a lot of money with a managed account, and he convinced Mr. Belfort to give this money manager a shot. So Mr. Belfort made a small speculative investment of approximately $200,000. $200,000 is not a small investment, that is a substantial investment, and CoffeeZilla can intended that Jordan must have been aware, or at the very least, harbored some level of trust or belief in this company. The fact that he chose to invest such a considerable amount of capital indicates a level of confidence or familiarity. Despite later revelations that the enterprise was actually a fraudulent get-rich-quick scheme akin to a Ponzi scheme. Considering Jordan's history, where he gained notoriety for being a con man, it seems improbable that he had no inkling or awareness of this company's dubious nature. But to this day, Jordan is out doing speaking tours, paying the phantom tax, and his the gritty. He's just fine. Most influencer scams involve a creator promoting a dubious product to their fans to make a quick buck. But what about when someone scams the influencers instead? One of the scams that CoffeeZilla uncovered was a massive podcast scam involving several big name celebrities from the comedy world like Theo Vaughn and Brendan Schaub. Our podcast was defrauded. We were stolen from, we were taken advantage of a lot of ways to say it. The company that did it is Cast Media, and the man that did it is Colin Thompson. Launched at some point in 2016 by Colin Thompson, Cast Media describes itself as a production company that specializes in podcasts. In practice, though, they function more as an ad agency, connecting sponsors to talents. They would get a brand connected with a podcast and in exchange, before they would pay the podcast, they would take a cut of the revenue. The predicament arose here when Cast Media began displaying an unsettling trend of delaying payments. Payments. Initially, these payment delays stretched out over several weeks, but then it extended to months, leaving podcast creators in a lurch. They were doing sponsorships through Cast Media, but they weren't being paid for them. The situation escalated further when Cast Media suddenly announced that they were on the verge of bankruptcy, dropping the bombshell that in order for the podcasters to receive their payments, they would need to sign a particular agreement with another company named Podcast One, which was supposedly in the process of acquiring Cast Media. The proposed deal offered a compensation structure that included immediate payment of 33% of the outstanding funds, another 33% disbursed over a span of two years, and a portion of the company's stock granted after the same duration, the actual value of which remained uncertain. This proposal was underhanded, to say the least, pressuring creators into accepting an unfavorable deal under duress to retrieve money that they were owed. But CoffeeZilla was more curious about how the $4 million went missing in the first place. The first thing he did was ask the person that Theo Vaughn accused of scamming to see what his side of the 
story was. Colin Thompson said that revenues had dropped 55% over 2022, and because of the model of the company, he was not able to pay creators on time. But then Coffee interviewed other partner creators that revealed these delays had actually happened way before 2022 and went all the way back to 2018. Okay, you joined them in 2018. 2018. Yeah. So when did you start getting late payments? Basically, like they didn't come when they said they were going to come. And when did you stop getting full that payments? Right away. I, I, I answered that right away. That was right before, from the first check we were supposed to get. It didn't arrive when he said. It was never on time. So yeah, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't unusual if it was like a month late, a month and a half late. And then when it goes from, all right, a month late to two months late to three months late. And then I would say, hey, where's this? Uh, where's the deposit at? Go. Yep, they're, they're trying to figure it out, man. He says it's, you're, he has this whatever investment coming, you're gonna get this huge lump sum of money. So then that's didn't come, then you're looking at, you know, now you're looking at four months, like it was the money. Initially, this issue may not have raised red flags because the outstanding amounts were relatively small. However, as the years passed, the numbers really racked up. For creators like Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen, the unpaid dues escalated substantially. The pending payments surged, stacking up to an eye-popping $400,000. And that's just for one show. They claim to be owed 1.6 million. Now remember, Brian is just informed about firing the kid. Yeah. I have to manage Thick Boy, Golden Hour, the other shows that are owed money. So Brian's like, can you believe this? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that 400 grand is terrible. <laughs> Try 1.6 mil, bro. Right. Colin, the individual held responsible by many, staunchly denied any suggestion that such events took place. However, CoffeeZilla's interview with one of Colin's business partners unveiled a completely different narrative. The partner disclosed a scenario where nearly everyone expressed grievances about prolonged payments, highlighting a situation where a lone individual managed funds using nothing more than Google Sheets. The entire payment process seemed convoluted, involving numerous email chains and random messages. Additionally, several other individuals whom CoffeeZilla had converted Conversed with regarding this matter, wished to remain anonymous out of fear that Colin might pursue legal action against them. A concern that Colin had previously raised by threatening Brian Callen with a lawsuit. Hey Brian, the ensuing damages, if you were to cause this deal to unravel, could be substantial, potentially falling within the region of 10 to 20 million and would impact the broad spectrum of parties. Consider this a serious caution. Any attempt to disrupt or compromise this transaction would lead to decisive legal actions. We strongly encourage you to bear in mind the significant repercussions that your actions may bring about. CoffeeZilla delved further into uncovering the hidden intricacies of this scam. In the podcasting realm, one thing that many podcasters will seek for sponsorships is a minimum guarantee. This guarantee sets the minimum income threshold for a given month, safeguarding against potential financial struggles from keeping the show afloat. It's a safety net. However, Colin's explanation suggested that this was where the root of their problems lay. He attributed their financial decline to initially overpaying these minimum guarantees, creating an unsustainable situation where meeting these commitments each month became challenging. Colin's former business partner agreed but he also said that he thinks some of the money went to Colin's personal fund. We've got Colin's narrative. As his business partner, you look at the situation, four million missing. The big question on everyone's mind, where did the money go? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple places that the money has gone. Um, one is he built a custom house. And um, he was known for going on big crazy vacations uh in you know he went to hawaii multiple times in 2022 and was posting about it on his social media coffeezilla proceeded to verify that colin did in fact purchase the million dollar house but his actions extended beyond this property acquisition at the verge of declaring bankruptcy he made a strategic move involving the house shifting its ownership into a trust managed by an llc he established coffee pondered this maneuver suggesting it might have been an attempt to shield assets and prevent losing the house due to the bankruptcy process when confronted colin offered an explanation claiming that coffee's assumption was incorrect and that his motives were driven by a genuinely sympathetic reason jim Cornette supposedly called out the general vicinity where Colin resided, stirring a slew of threats, which is why Colin opted to hide his house in such a manner. Intrigued, CoffeeZilla sought out the episode featuring Jim Cornette to investigate this claim, only to discover that what Colin claimed happened didn't happen. Jim Cornette never mentioned this guy's exact address, he merely alluded to the broader area. Moreover, Colin had concealed his house in June, but the episode didn't air until July, contradicting everything he had stated. When confronted with this, Colin said that, they revealed general details. I anticipated 
eliminated the possibility. Brian last threatened it very specifically in my original email exchange with him in May. When looking through the email exchange, CoffeeZilla saw that this threat did not exist at all. At this juncture, CoffeeZilla began to sense something off about Colin's narrative and became increasingly convinced that he was lying. So he took it upon himself to delve deeper. His first lead, the website where Colin registered his LLC, the one he purportedly used to cloak his house. Lo and behold, the site explicitly declared its primary function as asset protection. It's a fancy way of saying that they safeguard assets in case of bankruptcy or other liabilities. When confronted, Colin said, I can't speak to what's written as marketing material on a website. I didn't write it. Come on, bro. We got you, okay? I can't go show up at an asset protection only store and say, hey, I was just looking for a little anonymity. You know, that's not being honest. And look, I don't know how dumb this guy thinks we are, but in my opinion, what happened is pretty simple. I think Colin bought a $1.7 million house the same year as he had trouble paying people. I think his accounting was always sketchy. I think he overpromised people money to attract new talent. And I think in the end, he tried to sell it all to a bigger company and force these podcasters into raw deals. Ultimately though, there were no legal repercussions faced by Colin for his actions, leaving coffee to emphasize a crucial lesson. Often, you might not actually require an intermediary. If you're a podcaster and you wanna get ads, you can do it yourself. You don't need this company. Cast Media now appears as a blank page online, with many still wondering about Colin's current endeavors and whereabouts. Unfortunately, at this point, it's unlikely he'll ever see justice. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching. And until next time, leave me alone.